Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. It's my great pleasure to introduce Sean Gao from CMU. Uh, Sean did many interesting things. Uh, he defined a, a notion of delta accessibility that's very interesting. Today he's going to talk a little bit about that, but he's also now working on cyber physical systems, and I'm eager to, know, to learn more about it. Thank you. Um, I think it's okay if I just stand here. Or? Yeah. Okay. Um, Hi, um, it's really an honor, a great honor to be here. Um, I want to talk about our recent work, um, this emerging field called cyber physical systems. A cyber physical system is a combination of digital computation and, and the physical environment. Basically, what you have, I mean, this is actually um, <clears throat> part, of, part of every sophisticated machinery in our daily life. You have some kind of chip, you have some computation going on, and you have the computational part interacting with the environment. Right? It gets information from the sensors and it has actuators that can um, control the, the physical environment. And all this are done um, in real time. Those systems are really everywhere. You can see that um, <clears throat> all the big sort of companies that are not considered as software companies, they're really what we could call cyber physical systems because they need to develop those big machines and also the software that's going on in those machines. And here are some examples, more concrete examples. One is the, um, this one is the um, autonomous car being developed at CMU. So it has a lot of sensors and has its own uh, actuators that it, it is driving itself. And this is what you see in a, a cockpit in a plane. And this is a um, <clears throat> cardiac pacemaker that people will have you know, in their body. And this is the control room of a nuclear plant. Okay. So all those systems, they have this uh, characterization that it's you know, computation combined with some really, um, you know, some really important physical uh, environment, some, some, some physical control problem. So the, um, the two most important features about this kind of systems, one is that it's, it's very complicated, right? So if you want to reason about the system combined with the dynamics of you know, the environment, it's really a complicated thing. And the second thing, the other thing, is that it's very safety critical. Right. So if you think about having a uh, a blank screen on your desktop and laptop, you, you the most you you're losing is um, you know a day's work. But if you have a blank screen on the plane, which actually happens in the um, um, in the uh, I think it's the Air France uh, flight in 2009, which. Um, um, <clears throat> which crashed and um, I think um, 200 people died or something, hundreds of people died. And, and that was because the, uh, the, the sensors, the, the sensor for the speed of the plane uh, was frozen and the control software on the plane was giving a blank screen saying that you have invalid data and it stopped to do anything. Um, and then the pilot, the pilot didn't know how to control the plane at that point, and it was just a, you know, a few seconds, a window of a few seconds that you know they can make the right decision, but they, they made the wrong decision. They 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 um, they tried to pull the, the plane up, but that's the wrong thing to do, and 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 the plane just crashed, just crashed into the ocean. So um, 
the way that we look at it, I mean, we look at cyber physical systems first from a um, model point of view. So you want to sort of understand the underlying, the basic um, theoretical model for things first. That is something, what we, something that we call a hybrid system, which is that you have different types of continuous control. Uh, usually in, in control theory, you would talk about a continuous system and you, you talk about just one set of uh, uh, dynamics. But in a hybrid system, because of the integration of digital computation, it's actually several, ty several uh, sets of control rules, uh, the, the continuous control, and between them you have discrete uh, mode changes. If you look at it more mathematically, basically you have different modes. In each mode, you have um, uh, a set of, say, differential equations defining the continuous thing. And then between the modes, you have decisions. Right? If something happens, if the sensor value gets bigger than something, um, you, do, you go to that mode. And if uh, something else happens, you go to you know, another mode. So this is what we call a hybrid system. Um, people would say that um, all those things are part of what we call embedded systems right now. And the, um, the reason that we talk about this new sort of field of cyber physical systems is really you want to focus on the integration of computation, physics, and you know, sometimes you have com communications networks. Well, in the... Um, uh, usual setting in embedded systems, the problems you are mainly dealing with is the limited computation resource that you have. But that's not the, I mean, that's due the, the important part of it, uh, of the problem, but the, the really the key thing now is the integration of, of digital things and, let's say, analog things, right? Discrete things and continuous things, and it's really the hybrid picture that's, that's important here. And, the, the, the most difficult task is to cope with the complexity of those systems and ensure the safety, crit I mean, ensure the reliability of those safety critical systems. So what we want to have, I mean, as people start to work in this field, we want to have a, a guiding roadmap, right? A methodology that you can you can understand, you can use to, to know the things that you want to do on those systems. And by that, it's usually uh, several things that you want to have. First, you want to, you want to definitely have a language to talk, to talk about the things you, you, you have, right? You want to have a language to, to model those systems, and you want to have a language that you can specify the uh, properties, the questions that you want to solve. And then you want to have a systematic theoretical understanding of what you can do, right? what you can solve. And that's the second thing. You want to know about the, at least the theoretical computability and complexity of the problems that you are facing in, for those kind of systems. And then you want to have a systematic way of dealing with those questions, right? Those, those, those methods that you, you, you propose in a systematic way, they should re respect the complexity of the problems. And also, there should be evidence that you can have realistic tools that can help you to solve those problems using the methods. And then, in the end, you want to have a reasonable understanding about how you can go from theory, from theoretical models, from you know, formal things, to actual systems, to a piece of C code in your, you know, uh, um, plant, your nuclear um, control system. So this is this is the list of things that we would look for in, a, um, in coming up with a methodology, and there are a lot of difficulties with this, just because of the 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 high complexity of the problem that that we're looking at. So first, when people try to model cyber-physical systems, hybrid systems, um, we realize that um, the, I mean, the, um, 
I, I, will, I will come back to this later, actually. This is going to be the first thing that I'll talk about. It, it, it's quite difficult to have a formal language to, um, to, 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 to contain every, all the features that you want to have to describe those systems. It's hard to put in, say, differential equations and uh, you know, logical decisions in the same framework. Uh, of course, there are a lot of uh, proposals, but uh, we're going to um, say that we have a simple, not simple, but a first order, a, a sort of um, standard logic that can, can allow you to express all those things. Um, but that's not a, a, a very easy thing to do. And then, very early on in the proposal of hybrid systems, people realized that the almost trivial questions about hybrid systems are undecidable. For instance, uh, reachability for um, hybrid systems with constant dynamics, really um, even simpler than that, having two two or three variables that um, that's having a dynamic a dynamics of uh, of one just 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 those very simple constant dynamical dynamics give you undecidable problems because you can encode Turing machine and all and do a lot of fancy things um, so there's really a pessimistic outlook at the um, at the problems it's, it looks like nothing can be solved right and um, the tools, because of this, um, the, the tools that are, are proposed are, are usually focused on uh, very simple problems. You don't, you don't target at, um, say, um, you know, real realistic systems with nonlinear differential equations and, um, you know, very complicated uh, decision changes that, that the, the tools are, are, are not available to, to handle those systems at all. And then, um, there's a lot of research on hybrid system theory and um, the transition from the theoretical results to the practical uh, system is not very clear. So I'm going to talk about the language problem first. I'm going to talk about the logic that we're going to use. What we need, if we try to come up with a language, we need to have several things, right? So the first thing, we want to reason about systems that are in the uh, Euclidean space. You want to talk about the real numbers, right? It's not you know, the, the, the digital controls anymore. And then you want to have um, your usual mm, logical constructions. You want to have uh, Boolean connectives, and you want to have quantifiers. And then you want to have all the real functions that are actually needed in the engineering of those systems, because the engineers are building those systems already, right? And they have good theories, about good control theory, you know, different different things that they, they can reason about them, and they know partially how to uh, build the systems. If you want to have a a general methodology, at the minimum, you need to be able to talk about those functions, right? And that includes, you know. Um, polynomials, transcendental functions, differential equations, and everything else. That is very much beyond what I would say, um, what we already have in formal methods. I mean, the, the logic that we have, temporal logic, you know, different um, kinds of first order series, they're really not containing those kind of actual real functions that, that we would like to, ha to have. This is why we um, first studied this first order logic over the real numbers with what we call computable real functions. This concept comes from um, computable analysis. So you have a real function. The, 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 the formal way of understanding a real function is really to look at it as a mapping from an infinite sequence approximating your argument of the function to an infinite sequence approximating the value of your function. Right? So basically, what is a sine function? It's taking a sequence, a call tree sequence, approximating x, and, it's should, and there should be something that's giving you this approximation to the value of sine. 
sine of x. And if you have such a machine, you will say that this function is computable. So this, all those functions that are computable in this sense, they're called type 2 computable functions. It's called type 2 because um, it's talking about functions on sequences of integers, which are like functionals of those functions. Right? So it's type 2. And we don't need to go into the deep theory of computable analysis, but it's enough to know that almost every numerically computable function is computable in the type 2 sense. So you can have all those functions, trigonometric functions, exponential functions, differential equations, you know, even um, ordinary or partial differential equations. As long as you have a reasonable procedure to compute the function numerically, we say it's very likely that you can prove that it's type 2 computable in theory, and it's part of this set of functions. So we talk about the first order theory over the real numbers with arbitrary computable real functions. So it's LRF, R is the real number, you know, you, you talk about things over the real numbers, and this F is the set of arbitrary computable real functions. So it includes all the functions that I just mentioned, and you can write down formulas like this. Right? So you can say, this is something that if you give it to an engineer, uh, it will look, look like something that's saying, you have two signals, and you're wondering if there are some coefficients such that um, you know, they're, 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 they're not exponentially far away from each other. So this is the, the language that you can describe. I will later show you that's the case as, as well, that you can describe almost every problem in, let's say, control engineering or um, um, yeah, this kind of topics in, 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 in continuous systems. But of course, the trouble is you can write down those functions, you can define a theory, you can throw in all those functions, but the formulas are naturally undecidable. Uh, it's just too complicated because even the simplest trigonometric functions combined with arithmetic is able to give you natural numbers. And that gives you an undecidable theory. But then we asked this question. Um, those formulas are so difficult to, uh, to, 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 to handle um, from our perspective. Then why is it the case that people are solving engineering problems every day? Right? There, there's got to be a reason for, um, for the, the 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 you know the 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 routine procedures that that engineers can use to build those systems and to reason about those systems and the key of the change of perspective is actually we need to look at numerical procedures we need to have a way of logically formally understanding numerical procedure, procedures that are used for handling those functions and this is a notion that we defined. Suppose you have an um, LRF formula, a formula that contains all those computable functions and all. You can put it in a normal form like this. I'm not going to, uh, this is, this is going to be easy to see. You, you can push all the negations inside and you can, all you need is to have these two kinds of relations, right? This is a normal form. And we define the delta weakening of that formula to be something that you only make minor change on the atomic formulas. You change the zeros, you relax them by minus delta. Okay? So you call this uh, phi of minus delta, which is the delta weakening of the formula. You can also define delta strengthening of, of logic formulas by just uh, use positive delta but uh, we don't need to talk about that here. We're going to mention that later. Then we define this notion called delta decision problem, which is instead of asking whether a sentence is true or false, you allow one-sided errors. Okay? So 
you say that your procedure can return one of the following answers, either phi is false or phi of minus delta, which is a, a relaxation, a weakening on the original formula, is true. Okay? So again, you can define that uh, phi is true or phi plus delta is false, something like that. It's a dual of this. They're all called the delta decision problem. And the key theoretical um, result that's leading to a, uh, a, a, positive, a positive outlook of using, those, 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 using this language is what we call, uh, the, uh, what we call delta decidability over the reals, which is that the delta decision problem for any of those formulas, the assumption is that they're bounded, which means all the variables are bounded in, um, in bounded domains in the, um, uh, in the formula. The, all those formulas are delta decidable. This is in sharp contrast to the fact that very simple formulas of that kind, if you only have the trigonometric functions, they are highly undecidable. And actually, you can have a complexity matter on those um, sentences, which is that, um, you know, sigma and sentences just in the polynomial hierarchy raised by the complexity of the functions that you have. And the easy way of, of understanding this is that I could tell you the SMT problem, the existential formulas containing trigonometric functions and, you know, exponential functions, which are all polynomial time computable um, continuous functions in the type 2 sense. The complexity of, sol uh, of solving those formulas, the existential formulas, is just MP complete. Okay, so that is, if you don't look at the delta decision problem, if you look at the, the, the standard decision problem, it's an undecidable problem. It's actually highly undecidable. But if you look at the, uh, the delta problem, it's, it's actually MP complete. It's actually not harder than the set solving problem itself. That is um, a very positive result for this, right? I mean, it's still, uh, still NP-complete, but it's really much easier than what uh, we uh, expected. And then we are done with the language. We can start talking about the models. So a hybrid system, I just showed some pictures, but um, uh, a real definition is something like this. So you can have a set of formulas called the flow. They define the continuous dynamics for each location, each control mode. And you can have a set of formulas called the jump that defines the conditions for you to switch between the modes. And you have invariance, and the invariances are the conditions that says, you know, if you want to uh, stay in this mode, if you want to do the continuous flow in this mode, you have to satisfy some condition. And the initial, the initial conditions are the things that you use to, to start uh, the system. Everything can be written in this LRF formulas because I just said you could have differential equations. The solutions of differential equations are computable. They are in the set of this F, and you can just write down all those uh, dynamical system, continuous system that you're interested in. So the if you if you look at this this automaton and if you if you um, sort of if, if you look at the execution of those automaton, you're going to see something like this. The, the trajectory of hybrid automata are what we call uh, hybrid trajectories. They're basically piecewise continuous, um, you know, surfaces in in the in the in the state space, because in each switch, I mean, in the, in the disconnected points, it's the, the, the switch between different control modes that you're doing. And if you let it go through time, it, it's going to be like this. And on the left-hand side is the notion of hybrid time that's used in producing this picture, because you can now consider 
time to be a two-dimensional structure where you keep, it, you keep track of the discrete changes you have and you keep track of the time duration you, you, uh, you have in each discrete uh, location. And they have, uh, you can define a mapping from here to here and that's the uh, trajectories we're talking about. This is an example of a probably a simple, a, 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 a most popular simple model of the hybrid system, which is a bouncing ball. Okay. So I didn't draw the ball here, but the idea is you start with some ball about the ground, and you drop it and make it um, <clears throat> do free falling, and you can have the first day to be going down. And when you hit the ground, which is that the, uh, the, the height of the ball gets to zero, it's going to be, uh, it's going to bump up, right? And this, this two modes will, will alternate um, for many times. This is actually uh, something we have in our tool that I'm going to mention later. You can just write down those formulas just on a, uh, uh, in a simple text. And this is the trajectory that also we can produce it from our tool, but it's uh, something we just saw. It's piecewise continuous, right? So this is like the ball is going to um, bump back uh, uh, a few times, and the velocity changes based on the different modes that you have. And this is a more uh, serious model. This is actually a faithful uh, characterization of this um, atrial fibrillation problem. So you can consider the, uh, the heart as a hybrid system, and you can make transitions between uh, different modes. And in, the, in each mode, you have a set of quite complicated uh, differential equations, nonlinear differential equations describing the behaviors, and this is the trajectory of the system that we can produce by our tool as well. So now we're done with the language and the models, and we can start talking about the questions we can solve, we want to solve about those systems. Usually, um, we know that given any system we have, the questions are mostly, of course, you can have very complicated uh, problems, but the, the, the two big categories is safety questions and liveness questions. And in the context of hybrid systems, most likely you either talk about reachability, which is a safety property, or you talk about uh, stability, which is more like a liveness property, because you're going to say that you know, it's going to reach to some point such that the, 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 the system stabilizes. Uh, the, the formula here is a bit complicated. It's not really in the language that I just defined because you quantify over the trajectories, but I'm going to explain how you actually do them using the, um, the first order logic that we just defined. Okay, let's look at reachability first. The standard way, one of the standard ways of dealing with um, reachability questions is to use bounded model checking, right? So usually, the, uh, what we, when we talk about bounded model checking, we have in, in mind something like you have a finite state system and you unwind the system up to some finite depths and you um, solve the question of whether um, some, you know, unsafe property is, is satisfied. But we can do this just using the logic that we just talked about. You can have, um, you can unwind the discrete changes in the hybrid system. And in each change, you have a continuous flow that's defined by the flow predicate of the system. So you basically start with the initial states, and you have a flow that's giving you something like this. You start with, uh, let's say, x0. You start with x0, and you take some time, say p0, and go to another value. And that value 
satisfies the flow predicate. Right? It's like a solution of your differential equation up to some, um, some time point. And then it's possible that you want to make a jump from, you know, from the, the end of, con of your continuous flow to a new set of states and you switch mode. So basically, you want to uh, encode the possible transition of the whole system using this logic formula. And then you say, after k unrolling, you, have the, uh, you ask the question of whether it can be uh, an unsafe state. Right? So this is the first order encoding. And here, I'm simplifying a lot of details. Uh, actually, you, when you, you don't see anything about the mode invariant here, right? Because actually, if you have the invariants, you have to say something like, um, you, the invariants uh, um, tells you that during the flow from xi to xit, you should stay in the invariant. So if you use the, the logic language to say that, it's like, for all t within 0 to ti, the invariant should hold. Right? So that's actually an exists for all sentence, if you write everything down. And then if you have non-deterministic flow, it's even more difficult, because your first order language cannot choose between different possible um, flows. You need to have, you can read it in the paper, that you need to have another existentially quantified set of variables saying that not only that you are always in the invariant, but you can actually follow all the possible points and they form a one particular trace in the continuous flow. That's something you can encode in using exists for all exists. So actually, given this encoding, you directly know that bounding knowledge checking problem for those systems, I mean for, um, right, for those systems, the complexity is actually, if you don't have invariance, it's just, uh, um, you know, np to the c, where c would be the complexity that you have for the functions in your, in your, in your system. And when you have invariance and non-deterministic flows, you will correspondingly have, you know, sigma 2, sigma 3 problems. So you can easily um, obtain all those complex series out. Then the, um, the delta decision that we were talking about is a relaxation of the standard decision problem, right? So, so here you need to make sure that this relaxation is not doing any harm to you. And this is why it doesn't do any harm. Basically, if you use the delta decision procedures, you solve this formula, you solve, I, I omitted the uh, existential quantifiers. I mean, you, all the quantifiers, all, all the variables should be existentially quantified. So if you solve that satisfiability problem, either you know that there's no solution, right? Or you know that there's a delta set solution, a delta set answer. So that corresponds to, to, to two different claims. Either you say that the system is safe up to the, 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 the depth that you have unrolled, you, you have unrolled, or the system is delta unsafe, which means that you have found a solution to the formula, which is an, uh, you would say, a bug to a bug falsifying the safety properties that you have. But it's delta set which means that your actual system may not have this bug. That's possible, because we may be wrong. We may be saying, we say delta set, set, it may be actually unset. But we know that given some perturbation, this weakening on the formula, this weakening on the system, this bug would actually be a bug. Right? So, um, so if you think about it, delta, we just said, Delta can be arbitrarily chosen, right? So if you're an engineer, you can choose a small enough delta such that this answer actually tells you about the robustness problem in your system. So that is why this relaxation is actually helping you 
with this analysis. Right? So with a delta perturbation, the system has a bug, which means that the system is likely going to be wrong in practice, in reality, if you have some kind of error going on. And if the delta is really small, you, you really should be worried. And then another way of doing reachability, another category of methods, is uh, to use um, inductive invariance, right? So you want to show that um, the system satisfies some safety property because you can find a set such that the system basically never goes out of that set. And that set actually implies your safety property. So you're, you're like doing an, an induction proof mathematically. So using the, the formulas, using the um, <coughs> um, LRF formulas, this kind of technique can also be easily expressed. So basically the idea is that you have this um, formula encoding the variant. And you just want to make sure that at first the system starts from that environment. And um, the flow of the system doesn't bring you outside of the environment. And the jump of the system doesn't, uh, <clears throat> doesn't bring you outside of the environment as well. And then in the end, the environment actually implies the safety property. right? So one difficulty uh, in the standard approach to, the, to this is actually uh, this flow part. So in discrete systems, we can say that um, you know, you're in the environment now and in the next step, you should not go outside of the environment. But in a continuous system, you don't have this notion of the next step, right? You don't have the next time point to talk about. And, um, you don't know what to write. So there, um, there's a lot of research going on saying that, um, for instance, you can consider the, um, essentially the vector space, right? And come up with something called the differential invariant, um, such that you, you can just look at the derivatives of the, the, the right-hand side part, the right-hand side of your differential equations, and make sure that they do not bring you outside of the environment. But there are many tricky problems with that approach, actually. We, I'm not gonna, um, gonna go into details there, but um, what I wanted to say is just using this logic that allows you to write down differential equations, actually you can now throw in a really small epsilon that is good for you modulo the, the the, the, the delta um, decisions that, uh, that the, the delta decision correctness guarantees that you're going to make. You can, you can choose that epsilon such that you can directly write down this, this um, differential equation and ask, you know, the next step is actually this epsilon step. So again, you can delta decide the formulas that you just listed here. Here actually what I omitted was the universally quantified variables, right? All the variables should be universally quantified and you should ask a solver about whether the negation of that formula is satisfiable. And if that is not satisfiable, you would say true, you would say that the environment actually holds. And if the formula is satisfiable, you have found a counterexample to the proof rules for the inactive environment. And what you can claim using a delta decision procedure is that the variant would fail under, you know, again, delta perturbations. So this is um, how you could use the delta decisions to do unbounded reachability checking. And of course, the most difficult question is how um, you can actually search for those inductive invariants, and there are methods like template-based search where you leave out some parameters and those questions can also be easily encoded because you uh, just need you know one block one one more alternation of quantifiers and you can 
show theoretical results saying that the template-based search for invariance is like um, sigma two to the C, you know, things like that. They are easy to, there are results that are easy to get. Now, the third, uh, the other type of properties that we usually worry about um, um, for, you know, hybrid systems is stability. Right? But bounded time stability is really can be can be encoded just as reachability. And uh, you can define notions like bounded delta stability, and you can, again, give complexity claims about that. That's why I, I call it a, a general methodology. It's really, you write down things in this logic formula, um, which gives you, you know, for free, all those complexity results for those problems. And um, bounded time stability is like, um, uh, it's a bit like termination as for uh, programs. It's something in instead of the ranking function that you're looking for, you will look for Lyapunov functions. And you have conditions for um, the uh, Lyapunov functions to work to guarantee the stability of the system. And all those you can describe by this logic. I just won't uh, write those formulas anymore. Um, so I just want to add in this. Um, um, part about our tool that can actually solve the formulas that I just wrote down on, in all those slides, right? It's available at um, the real um, web page. You can find it on my uh, home page, and, and if you just Google for the real, I'm pretty sure you can find that. It's open source and it can handle all those functions, all those formulas that I just mentioned. And for hybrid systems, um, we have a front end where you can actually um, put in the, um, the hybrid system descriptions that I just, that I just mentioned. And you can um, ask about um, reachability questions and different things. So the tool is actually quite scalable. I mean, we proved complexity results saying that it's not much harder than SAT. It's not much harder than this, um, you know, uh, NP-complete problems that, that you actually routinely can handle. We actually also see this in the performance of our solver. We have handled formulas generated from bounding model checking of some complicated systems um, that i probably show on the next slide. That contains hundreds, actually, uh, I forgot, 800, 900 are variables. And they involve, again, like 200, 300 nonlinear differential equations. And you can actually solve them. Um, and there's no serious limitation on the signature that you can have in this tool. Because basically, uh, you could recall that our procedure are, are, are using those numerical algorithms. And as long as you can numerically compute something, you can put that as part of your um, your, um, your, your decision procedure, and you can uh, delta decide those formulas. So in the tool, we allow those trigonometric functions, differential equations, and all. So we try to, um, to handle models from many domains. We are working on car transmission and flight control, and we have um, results on um, biomedical devices and cancer therapy, and we're also doing power system, which contain a large number of differential equations with trigonometric functions on the right-hand side. that are really, really big models. This is just to show you a few systems that we can handle, and um, I won't go into the details of them, but uh, you can see that they are complicated differential equations, and these graphs are showing you the, um, the solutions. Basically, if you want to solve a uh, reachability, if you want to answer a reachability, uh, reachability question, we can give you a witness for, a, um, for, uh, an, for the answer that your system can actually delta reach your, 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 uh, your goal. So those uh, pictures, they're actually um, quite non-trivial. I mean, each 
line is um, um, is actually obtained from a, um, a a trace of how long is it? And how do you remember? It's very big, so it can be like um, can it go up to a gigabyte? No, not yet, right? But but it could. I mean, it's it, yeah. So it, it's um, it, it's actually quite non-trivial to produce those, those, those graphs. So now I'm going to um, go more into the design or synthesis problems into those um, um, hybrid systems. And the reason that we, we can talk about them is because we realize that, uh, I mean, not, not that we realize, but it's just um, everyone knows that it's just about solving the same type of formulas, but asking for more um, solutions for some different uh, variables, right? All you need to do is to pr parameterize the um, dynamics that you have in the system. And you want to say, you want to ask the question that, how do I design the system such that within a certain bound of time, you can reach a particular goal? And that is simply what you can write down with this logic formula. And you can just solve the, um, the design problem of this. And you will get a, um, a, uh, a list of solutions for those parameters. Precise, here, uh, a note is, uh, precisely speaking, when we talk about delta decisions, delta weakening, you are actually ensuring that uh, your error is on the right side, right? On the, not, I mean, the, the correct side. I mean, you, you, your error is ac actually helping you to debug the system. And if you want to solve the parameters, actually, um, you will need delta strengthening instead of delta weakening, because you don't want to say that your, this solution may work if you have some perturbation, right? You actually need to say that this solution should work if you um, I mean, regardless of any possible sol uh, perturbations that you have. It's a dual of the, the problem. And actually, doing the delta strengthening is not an easy thing. So this is why um, synthesis problems in this domain is harder, at least harder practically, um, than the verification problems. It's just because to get the delta strengthening of formulas to solve those, you need to have under approximations of the solution sets instead of the over approximation of solution sets, which are actually the assumption of all the current algorithms in this area. So the formulas that the, the, we, the, the, the algorithm that we implement in our tool, they give over approximations. Um, all the, uh, all the, all the decision procedures are usually um, targeting at verification problems, which require you to give over approximations. And this whole um, direction of doing under approximations when you solve the formulas, it's, it's, um, it's just starting. And this is something you need for, for synthesis problem. But um, um, for now, if you, if, I mean, we do handle those problems. And we can do a simple design and verification loop because you can sort of find a solution and then try to verify that it actually satisfies your property, so that you, you know, so that you throw away the errors on the on, on the bad side. So you can do things like that uh, for now. But in general, you would need a new set of solving strategy. And you can also do a lot of fancy things that are usually talked about in control theory. You can actually do optimal control here. I'm just using a a a. A, a, a simple formulation of the thing. Basically, you want to reach some goal, and you also want to make sure that the cost of your uh, control design is actually at the minimum. Okay. So usually, although here you have one more alternation of universal quantifiers, um, you're usually OK with replacing this by some some goal that you want to have. So basically, you don't, you don't have to find the absolute minimum 
cost, the, 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 um, the control plan that gives you the absolute minimum cost, but you are okay with finding a plan that's giving you a cost smaller than something, right? So you can usually approximate this uh, universal quantification here. And then I'm not going to, gonna go into the detail of more things, but you can do them. Um, it's just a matter of looking at the problem statement and encode them as logic formulas and then understand the you know, solvability, complexity, and actually having solvers that can actually solve them. And in general, you could think about um, a sort of algorithmic control theory. And this is probably a term that's used by others as well for maybe different meanings. But, but basically, you can think about encoding um, all those control problems into the appropriate logic formulation. And then you can, you can, you can, you can use logic solvers, that the, the, like the ones that, that we just saw, to solve those problems directly without you know, any manual work. Right? You could provide some heuristics that are built in into the solver, but you, you provide this interface that um, the control engineer could just write down the question that they are asking, and they're just directly calling the decision procedure to solve the problems for them. This is really like um, lifting what people are doing in the linear differential, in the linear dynamical systems to this nonlinear and hybrid domain, right? In linear systems, you usually would um, have a program running uh, linear algebra, and there are very clever algorithms going on. Um, but if you are beyond that scope, you basically um, have no systematic way of doing things. But now we're basically saying you can just write down those formulas in a formal way, in, in, in a logical way, and then use the automated reasoning tools, which are just uh, extensions of you know the algorithm that you probably originally had, but they are now having you know logic uh, capability for doing the logic decisions, which is the hybrid part of our system, and the capability of handling nonlinear differential equations, which is the nonlinear part of their thing. The whole the 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 whole framework becomes this formulation first, and then solving next and then you're done. So the hope is really to have scalable solvers that includes, that contains all the computational power you have in your usual standard algorithms and put them in this logic framework that you can, uh, you can just use to solve those questions. And then I, in, at the end, I, I want to talk about this mapping from um, realist I and mean, from theoretical models from formal answers to the actual programs that you can actually have in those systems. Um, the observation that started not just our work, but I I'm sure uh, everyone else's work as well, is that the embedded software, although they're very safety critical, they're very complicated, uh, they're in, you know, this, um, um, they have all those, uh, those difficult continuous mathematics going on. But the program structure itself is actually pretty simple. If you just look at uh, what you run, I mean, the software in your car, actually, we, 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 we um, we have practical experience with some of that. You would see just a big loop, you know, running at certain frequency. And within that loop, you have, um, you would rarely see very uh, advanced programming techniques, right? You, most likely you don't even need pointers. You would never have recursive calls, you would never have um, complicated programs, constructs. And that, if you think about the problem, problem um, in more detail, 
you see that it's really, um, I mean, the gap between the theoretical model and the actual code you have is really not that big. I mean, the gap is not that big. Basically, if you have a hybrid system that you can directly write down you know, in any tool, you have the differential equations defined and you have the logical decisions, then the, um, the correspond of course, this is a very simplified thing, that, but the, the basic idea is this, right? You have this big loop and you just have different cases and, and, and you switch between them and each time you execute your, your program up to uh, a, a, a delta t uh, duration. Right. So you're basically just um, translating the differential equations into difference equations that you have in the program. And all you actually need to do is to prove that the program that you have and the theoretical hybrid system model that you have, they are, you know, they bisimilar each other up to some error bounds. And that error bound, of course, is related to the delta t that you pick the, uh, the behavior of the function, say the Lipschitz constant of differential equations that you have, and some minor things. But the big structure is really something like this. So um, this is um, a, a simplistic picture of what people are now, are, are now calling the uh, the model-based design idea, right? So you have formal methods, you have verification and synthesis on the model level, and then you would directly generate code from that model. And most likely, all you need um, is some mapping from the variables that you have in the theoretical model to the um, commands that you need in the program. And then you need to prove the faithfulness of this translation from the theoretical model to the programs. And that is a task that's much more easier, much easier than the direct code verification that you can think about. Say you take this uh, thousands, tens of thousands line of code from a, uh, an embedded software and you wanna basically reverse engineer the or original control design. That is a very difficult problem. But if you, if you go from the model first, if you verify out your properties and then verify the translation is uh, useful, is um, reliable up to certain uh, error bound, you can actually do this. Right? And actually this is something that we are trying to do. Um, it's a real small robot that we're currently building at uh, CMU. Um, the property that you want to ensure, so it's just a, uh, uh, a very small car, it's just, it's not even a car, it's uh, two big wheels and, and one small one for balancing. And you want to program it so that it can run in, um, in any room and it just, it has sensors on it so that you want to verify that it doesn't, it never hits anything, right? It never hits a wall, uh, uh, a person uh, walking by, it never hits anything. That's something that you can verify on the model level, right? And also to, to have that, you actually need to synthesize the controller. For instance, um, the, 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 the small robot will see a wall and it needs to reduce its speed, right? And it needs to reduce the velocity. And then what's the acceleration that you wanna give for that? And that is something you can directly synthesize by solving the logical formulas describing the, the questions. And the, uh, the model that we have, I'm not uh, pay, um, showing it here, but it's really a just one page hybrid automaton, just like three or four control modes, and each mode is really not very complicated differential equations. It's really a small thing that um, we have a student from mechanical engineering who doesn't really uh, care about the, uh, <coughs> the, the, you know, the logic theory or something. The, he just learns about this hybrid automaton language that we have and he uh, made this and he's making this robot and then we're going to just generate the code directly for the robot and see that the formal properties that we verify on the model can actually, um, you know, you can actually witness that in practice. 
So this uh, is roughly all I want to talk about. The message is that there is this promising framework based on the appropriate logic containing all those um, functions that you have, whether in the Euclidean space and all. And you have autom uh, automated reasoning underlying the, uh, the, the logic. And the usual difficulty, either in theory or practice, can actually be avoided by our uh, formulation of this delta problem, delta descent problem, or delta reachability. There are all the reasonable things to ask. And then um, this gives you a new set of uh, techniques to handle nonlinear and hybrid system control. And the practical tools that we're developing, uh, you know, the power is going to uh, uh, keep growing, and we think it's very promising. And the, um, the future work is that you want to handle more complicated models, and also now that you have the logic solver, you can actually um, basically translate all the sophisticated verification and synthesis uh, techniques that you have in other domains, in hardware and software uh, domains, to this field and um, you know, improve the state of the art uh, greatly. So that's, that's all I want to say. Thank you. Right, right, right. Yes. Um, exactly, exactly. I, I do. So that's. Um, <clears throat> so I think it's actually open whether the sine yes. function itself. So if I, I mean, just adding this one single function gives yeah. undecided. I think that is still open. There are some constructions in the papers. And uh, you can easily show that it's undecidable if you have more complicated computable functions. Uh, I have some papers that I can show you. And uh, um, yeah, so my guess is actually for bounded problems, if you have the sine function itself, it doesn't give you undecidability. But for a bit more complicated functions, you, you would have undecidable problems. Yeah. Yeah. No, I was wondering about the sign because the standard proof for any periodic position, right? Exactly. It's for, it's for the unbounded case, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, then, you know, even with grants, we were discussing, I mean, trying to dig a reference, we right. couldn't find a reference. Exactly. For the case. Exactly. So, um, yeah, I remember seeing some very complicated construction about. How you? I think it's mainly about how you can encode Turing machines using the uh, yeah using the the sine function itself. Just mm -hmm. just using the sine function, and it, it has, the the construction is very complicated. I remember, um, and um, yeah, actually, I, I don't know if it's still in our current version of the paper, but I think we put that as a question. Like mm -hmm. open question, like yeah. is it possible that it's bounded and you don't have delta? You, you just the sine function itself gives you decide. Yes. Uh, yeah, that that that. Yeah. The, the other thing is when you see the signs the codes, mm -hmm. I thought the differential equations would not show up in the codes. I thought exactly. they were part of the environment. Right. But, exactly. But, but but why did you have an X in the pseudo code? <laughs> exactly. That that's really. Um, it's actually, uh, I, I shouldn't write it that way. I was just simplifying things just to show that you can do things. But, but yeah, so what you need is to put the, uh, so actually we have this, um, this uh, u. Right? So the control is the u variable. That's the thing that you really want to uh, encode. So, um, so here, right, so here I'm not talking about this difference between the control and the plant. So I was simplifying. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so usually you just have u and it's some other differential equation that you put in a different yeah. equation form. Yeah. 
Because basically you'd have like a sensor reading exactly. the X exactly. and reacting to Exactly, exactly. That's uh, that's what we uh, we're doing for the small robot here. Actually, we would allow the um, the user to to clarify some variables to be the sensor variables, and we leave them out in the synthesis. Uh, I mean, in the code generation. And if we run a simulation of the thing, we can actually make a product of. Um, you know, the control itself and the plant model, which itself is also another hybrid automaton that gives you sort of the signal. So, for instance, if you have a map of the room, uh, you mm -hmm. can put that in terms of a hybrid system that gives you different sensor data for okay. a different time. So you can take the product of those two automata and have this full thing running for a simulation. And then for code, all you need is the control part. I see. Which one do you see that's verified, never hits anything? Mm -hmm. You don't have a model of the environment, right? Exactly. But because, I, I mean, how precise is going to be this model? I mean, because you can have people running from exactly. the robots. And exactly. the, I, what you're going to consider in this Right. Like this that's, uh, that's, that's definitely uh, related to the, uh, to the actual parameters you have in the vehicle. For instance, the velocity of the vehicle is uh, a range. So um, you would, your property will likely be that if you don't have an object approaching your vehicle uh, with a velocity higher than something. Okay, you're going to consider the environment exactly. also has a velocity. Exactly. So, so I mean, like, uh, relative to, velocity, yeah, yes. so, yeah. So, so, um, so the final formal claim would be, uh, well, anything that we can actually verify on the model. And that will contain those parameters. I see. Yeah. So it just have a big thing hitting on the robot. Of course, it can't avoid that. So and there's some assumption. You had some modeling language? Like, this is the real language? Um, is it the dancing balls? Yeah, yeah. 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 Right. So this is the, the front end that we have. For the real. For, right, for the real or the reach, that, the reach. Uh, whatever okay. we call. Uh, so basically, you write down this uh, hybrid system um, nice. thing. Uh, and yeah, we just want to follow this uh, theoretical uh, format, just yes. uh, invariant to something, and the flow, you can yes. put differential cool. equation. Cool. And the jump, it's just, uh, you know, it's just SMT format. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, um, and we generate the SMT formulas from that. Yes. And yeah, so 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 this is the front end for bonding model checking and we're right now doing the invariant uh, based reasoning right now. And that's actually a, a would be a simpler script that you can write to generate the formula. And D which is in the camel, right? Yes. Yes, okay. yes, right, right. It's a, right, it's a front end on the real. But do reach does more than just being a boss here for the real? It has some. There's no computation for it. It just translates this just translate hybrid system to SMT2 exactly. and repeat it to the real. I see. But do you plan to have like some. Uh, do things like code of influence, all, all these things for the world of check? Mm -hmm. Maybe we can yes. do some abstraction or. Definitely. Yes, yes. Like yes. Um, yeah, I, I, I was mentioning yeah. that. Uh, all the techniques that you have in hardware software verification, yes. they should be built into this, and you can just uh, scale up to more and more um, complicated uh, models. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So we, we just want to provide this starting point that um, um, yeah, people can add things into it, and um, yeah, and. Somehow made it open source, so. Um, oh, the reach is not open source. It is open source. Oh, it's, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah. So, so just, just, just anyone can write can, can write scripts that translate to the folders or not. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But don't you need to stop doing the research? Shut down? No, I think they, they, they know. Okay. <laughs>